Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. This is going to be a playthrough of the first couple of turns of a scenario from Spearpoint 1943 Eastern Front. And I have selected one of the um, Operation Citadel scenarios because this is quite a nice one to show you not just how the basic game works but how adaptable it is to particular circumstances. So. Here is the reference card for it, July 1943, the beginning, the early stages of Operation Citadel. So the Soviets are having to hold their position against a German attack. And as you can see, the Soviets and the Germans have their pre-assigned starting forces um, with reinforcement decks that can be built up themselves. Now I've already created those and they're already in their draw piles, but just to take you through what's happening on the battlefield. That is the German front line over there. They have no reserves at the moment, so no artillery support or anything of that nature. I've left a gap in the Soviet front line because in this scenario, the Soviets, to represent their defences in depth, have two separate front lines. That is the first one, and that is the second. The second cannot be attacked by the Germans until the first has fallen. Um, but conversely, Soviet reinforcements cannot go straight to the first line of defence. They can only um, go to the second. And also, it's not possible in this scenario for the Soviets to reinforce the first line. So in effect, it's a bit of a forlorn hope. Its job is there to act as a breakwater and slow the German offensive down. Uh, the, the Russians also have um, backup in the form of heavy artillery in the second line. Now, of course, that cannot be attacked until the Germans have eliminated both forward defence lines, both front lines. Um, and, of course, in, if that happens in this scenario, they win the game anyway. The Russian victory points are awarded for bleeding the Germans dry, so they win the second, they get 75 victory points. Um, or achieve an overrun. Uh, an overrun happens when there are no enemy units for three consecutive turns facing your front line and you're considered to have completely broken through them. The Germans don't have to worry about overrun, but they must completely break both the first and the second Soviet defence lines. So both sides have prepared their reinforcements. Um, the Soviets have gone with staffing their front line with a fair amount of green soldiers. So there's no nice way to put this. They're very much there to soak up the shock of the initial German attack. While their better units, uh, veteran snipers, more partisans, uh, veteran riflemen and pilots and aircraft, and we've got some special cards as well, stage aircraft, which allows them to bring planes into play quickly. These are all lurking in their reinforcements, waiting to come in. The Germans have gone for a fairly mixed bag. Most of their units are veteran or experienced, so they've gone for a fairly heavy infantry contingent, um, although there is a tank um, ready to come in, but they do need a crew for it. It's been a bit of painful decision-making over what to have ready, and some appropriate cards to help their tanks. So the turn structure is fairly straightforward. I'm just going to zoom us in so we get a slightly clearer view of what's happening in the front line. So I'm going to keep the camera about there and I'll move the Soviet second front line out of the way to avoid any confusion. So I'm afraid at the beginning, the Soviet defenses are a rather brittle crust. The first thing that happens is both sides roll initiative. It's a ten-sided dice each. The Germans get a two and the Soviets get a five. So the Soviets go first with their commitment. Commitment is when you play cards from your hand that allow you to bring reinforcements into play um, or play special command cards that bolster your existing forces. Now, the Soviets naturally are going in preparation, going to deploy all their veteran units to their second line. 
out of sight of the Germans, really, but in game terms, you know, the, in game terms, the Germans can't attack these yet, but they can see them coming in and they know that the longer they take to break this first line, the tougher the second is going to be. Now, the Russians have that as well, and they're quite tempted to use this because it prevents the Germans from attacking them on the first turn. It buys time for the Russians to thicken their defences. So they are going to play smokescreen on the front line. They're also going to play improvised defence underneath the submachine gun squad, which is slightly more valuable to them than the inexperienced Mosin Nagant rifle squad. The Germans, for their part, are going to bring in a tank hunter squad with half tracks bearing them for the moment they'll come in as passengers i'll add them to the end of the german front line and they're also going to bring in some close support in the form of a five centimeter mortar team now that technically is part of the front line, it's just I'm afraid such is the size of the advancing German force, I am running out of table space. The Germans are also, with an eye to preserving the longevity of their vehicles, going to play two hull down cards, which improves the defensive um, rating of their armour units. They're going to give one of these to their most valuable units, the Tiger, and they're also going to give another one to one of the Panzer IVs, so that beefs them up quite a bit. So having done that, plane now moves to the um, target declaration phase, this is the beginning of the combat phase. Now, normally, the Germans would be assigning their units to attack targets in the front line, but because the Soviets have pulled a bit of a blinder by uh, quite literally blinding them with a smoke screen, they cannot do that. The scenario rules do not let them target the second front line, which is over there somewhere, and they have no long-range artillery which means they cannot target this unit in the Soviet rear line. So in the first turn, the Germans are actually pretty helpless. Now, the same is not true of the Russians. And uh, I see in the flavor text, it uh, notes that the 205 millimeter, a 203 millimeter gun rather, was nicknamed Stalin's sledgehammer. The Germans are about to find out why. They do not have a smokescreen card in play. The Russian gun has the range to target their units. And it is going to attempt a shot at their unprotected armour unit. Not much chance of killing the thing, but it might be worth it, worth the attempt. It does 18 points of damage. Now, in my previous video, I'd mentioned that the Soviets had, unlike the Germans who'd come with two ten-sided dice, the Soviets came with a 10-sider and an 8-sider, and I'd wondered whether this was meant to represent the slightly lower level of Soviet training and capacity. It turns out it was a genuine error, so the Soviets are meant to have two 10-sided dice as well. As it happens, they don't. The compromise I've reached, because I quite like the wrinkle, is that in scenarios before the summer of 1943, I play the Soviets with a 10 side and an 8 side. From late summer 43 onwards, i.e. Operation Citadel, I play the Soviets with two 10 sided to represent the improvements that were becoming more widespread through the Soviet army. And the quality certainly showed um, during the failed Operation Citadel. So the Soviets are going to fire. 
they are aiming at the Panzer IV. So their target number for hitting is 14 when they target armor. Let's see how they do. Oh dear, they get a double one. That is actually rather disastrous because that is friendly fire. Oops. So the ger regardless of the smoke screen, the German player is able to nominate a target in the Soviet front line which has been hit by friendly fire. That's not a good start. Not unnaturally, they nominate the T-34. So what happens now? Sigh. <laughs> well, sigh if you're Russian. Is the Soviets roll again. And that is a one again. Hmm, there must be something about these dice, but for once the Soviets are actually glad of that result. So they have rolled a one, which is added to the damage rating of this card of 18. So a total of 19. The friendly T34 has a defense of five altogether. So that leaves 14 damage points, which is its exact endurance. So unfortunately, the tank has been destroyed by friendly fire. Not a good start for the Soviet Union. Now, luckily for the Soviets, because the dice roll or the intensity roll was only a one for the amount of damage done, the crew survives incredibly. They bail out of their wrecked tank and they go underneath the Soviet reserves deck so they will reappear in a future turn. But this is really not brilliant. It seemed to be going so, so well for the Soviets at first, but now their, their preliminary bombardment, which was meant to break up the German attack before it was able to land a blow, has only succeeded in harming their own men. Not cool, guys. Not cool. So the next phase, combat was rather limited in this turn, thanks to the smoke screen, is the draw phase. Now, in this game, you always draw one card at the end of your turn from <clears throat> the command deck, which is the special events, bonuses um, deck. And after that, you have a choice. You can, either, you can draw two more cards, either two more command cards or one command card and a unit card. Now, before they make their draw, the Soviets are going to play this card, Stage Aircraft. So they, in, I must admit, something in a bit of a panic, now they're blowing up their own armour, have decided that it's very important that they get some aircraft and some pilots up, because we definitely need the air support. So riffling through their deck... They decide <coughs> they're going to come up with something the beloved IL-2. This is actually a really good choice, I think, because it has all the characteristics you'd want in a fighter, but it has plenty of tank killing capacity, and boy are the Russians going to need that fairly soon. So proceeding with the rest of their draw phase, um, they will, they've will. they decided that in the interests of continuing to bring up reinforcements, they will draw a command card and another unit card. So their new card is Artillery Barrage, which might actually serve them well, as long as their artillery back there can actually hit its target. So not, too, not feeling too hopeful about that one. The other card they draw is an artillery piece for their rear line, so strengthens their rear line, but unfortunately they have no artillery crew cards in their hand yet, so it's going to be some while before they can bring that unit into action. The Germans, for their part, are going to make the same decision. They draw 
stage aircraft as well. That will be helpful to them on a future turn. And they also, they decide they're going to draw both unit cards in the hopes of finding something that'll help them break through. And they happen to get an Ace Luftwaffe pilot and a Junkers 88, so things are hotting up. Apologies, I neglected to mention the second unit card the Soviets drew. It just so happens to be an artillery crew, so they will be bringing that artillery piece into play next turn. And that is the end of turn one. So the smoke screen disappears for all the um, dubious good that it did on turn one. And both sides roll initiative again. The Soviets continue to hold it, which is good for them. And so once more we go to the commitment phase. Not unnaturally, they are going to put that aircraft in the air. Now, the way aircraft work, are they are played off to one side. They're not considered part of the front or rear line. They, they rove independently. And, they are, and it's going to remain in operation for two turns. At the end of each turn, you have to mark the aircraft to show how many turns of flight it has performed. At the end of the second turn, if it's not been destroyed, this aircraft and its pilot will return to the Russian reserves deck. I tend to keep track of these by simply rotating the card. So, not before time, some Russian air support turns up. The Russians are also going to add a crude artillery unit to their rear line. For their commitment phase, the Germans do not yet feel they need to add any units. They've got plenty in the field already. <clears throat> They're also rather keen not to add that bomber because although it has an air-to-air -air capability, they don't really want it occupying the same patch of sky as that IL-2 because if it came to a fight, the IL-2 would have a much, much higher chance of shooting the German down. So they are going to hold off on that one because it's a bit risky. They might, they might have committed if it was a fighter, but for the moment there's no need for them to needlessly risk points. So they will hold off deploying anything at the moment. So the Russians have the initiative, and this time there is no smokescreen, so it's going to get messy. The Russian off-map artillery, the heavier gun is going to target the Tiger. The lighter gun is going to target the protected Panzer IV. The aircraft is going to go for the unprotected Panzer IV. The submachine gun squad is going to attack the rifle squad the veteran rifle squad over there, and the riflemen are going to attack the other regular rifle squad. So really what the Soviets are attempting to do is to try and pair off the armour and infantry element. Um, the choice is much easier for the Germans. They intend to just steamroller over what's left of the Soviet front line. So they are simply, because they're only dealing with infantry, it doesn't really matter, they're going to divide their force roughly in half with the tanks and one squad of veteran rifles going after the submachine gunners and the balance of the infantry force going after the unprotected riflemen. It is a huge amount of firepower about to descend on those two units. So... The Russians had the initiative, so they're going to go first. They are going to open the ball 
with the units that they're most likely to lose first. So the green riflemen are going to target that veteran rifle squad. So looking at what they've got, they can only target the one unit, which they've done, and they can use two of the weapons listed. They only have two in this case. So they're going to open fire with their rifles first, and they need a 14 to hit. They get a 7, not good enough. They're going to follow up with their DP machine guns. They get two rolls for this, and again they need 14 to score a hit. 12, they were close. 13, oh, painfully close but no, no cigar, unfortunately. So they blaze away at the um, regular rifle squad over there, but sadly to no effect. In the meantime, well aware that that unit has been targeted by them, the Germans are going to try and get the drop on them. So this very impressively equipped veteran rifle squad is going to try and take out the submachine gunners. They're going to use, in the interest of accuracy, their bolt-action rifles and their MG34. So they'll start with the bolt-action rifles. They need a 10 to hit. They roll a 14. Brilliantly done. Much as I hate to say it as the Soviet player. And so they do 3 damage. And their intensity roll is 9. So 12 damage altogether. The submachine gunners only have a defense of two uh, with, the, with their improvised defenses. Um, so subtracting that, that leaves a damage of ten. Not enough to eliminate them yet. However, the veterans are not finished. So they've scored 10 damage on them so far, they only need another 2 to destroy them. And their MG34s are going to speak up now, they get 3 rolls and they need 11 to hit. 14, oh dear, that's another hit already. That does 2 damage. Um, there's no point doing any further rolling, despite the defences, the submachine gun squad is simply overrun by the German attack. The turn now swings back to the Russians. And the next thing they would like to do is bring in their aircraft to try and take out try and take out the Panzer IV. So the plane comes roaring in. And it's going to use a combination of its bombs. It can only use these once, and it's 37mm cannon. So it's going to go with the bombs first, and it needs to roll a 12. And it rolls a 12. Nicely done. So the intensity is 7, added to 15, which, ouch, 12, okay. No, 22, rather. Subtract the... Panzer IV's defense of 6, which leaves 16. Um, that is very convincingly destroyed. And because the intensity was 7, the crew is destroyed along with the tank. So that is an excellent result for the Soviets. And they have just clocked up 14 victory points out of the 75 they need to win the scenario. Meanwhile, the Germans, rather unimpressed by this, um, are pressing on with their attack, um, just to show off the big beast. Oh, actually, no, I can't. They no longer have a target. They were gunning for the submachine gunners, but the infantry have already taken them out. So, the regular rifle squad is going to have a crack at the green rifle squad. I have a feeling I know how this go is going to end, but let's go through the motions anyway. They're going to use their rifles and their MG34. 
So rifles first. Nope, they miss. First crack with the MG34 is a miss as well. Second attempt. No, a miss again. Maybe the Russians will somehow survive all this. Oh no, a 20. And that's bad because on a 20, that's a critical hit. Irrespective of what happens, that unit will get a damage card. So the base damage level is one, plus five intensity is six. So ordinarily, that would not have been enough to wipe out that rifle squad or even damage it. But because they rolled a 20, they get a damage card regardless. So casualties among their unit affecting their primary weapon. So when it comes to their next turn, assuming they're still here to do anything, the Russians would not be able to use their Mosin Nagant rifles. They only have their machine gun now. Hmm, a good hit for the Germans. Now that seems a rather good place to stop at the moment because the combat in this game can get involved given the number of units. Um, obviously play speeds up the more casualties you suffer. But I hope that this has given you an overview of, of the push and pull of combat in Spearpoint 1943. Um, there are a few things which would make the game easier. I would recommend using markers or having an extra bag of D6s so that you can mark the targets as you allocate them. Now in the rules, the game suggests you simply orient the unit towards the unit it's targeting, but that can get a tiny bit messy and it's probably better to use some sort of system of markers, especially in a large scenario like this, where if I zoom all the way out, you've got multiple frontline units. In this scenario, there's even a second Soviet frontline here. You've got air support off to one side, and of course you have the Russian artillery units in support back there. So there's a heck of a lot going on. And although the game is simple, and although it flows quite smoothly, and there's not too much to worry about by way of rules to remember, it's just handy to have something that helps you keep track of all this. Um, I will play through um, to a conclusion and will comment on how I found things in my next video. But suffice to say, I think this game is a very good filler. It sits somewhere between a war game and what some might call a Euro game, but definitely closer to a war game, particularly in terms of the amount of effort that has gone into defining um, unit capabilities, their resistance to damage, how they interact with each other. It is quite a good clean system, although you, you do have to concentrate hard when the battles get big, as they tend to do on the Eastern Front. But again, I hope that has been useful. I will sign off there, and thank you very much for tuning in.